Millions of women in America will go to bed tonight without access to the health care and reproductive care that they had this morning. This is a health care crisis. What happens when we lose access to abortion? What happens when we lose access to safe, legal and local abortion? In June 2022, people in the United States lost the constitutionally guaranteed right to abortion after almost 50 years. The ripple effect of this change can be felt around the world and has opened up a vital and necessary conversation about reproductive rights. Take your hands off of my back. Pull it together, people, because we got to fight. The overturning of Roe v. Wade has made us realise how important it is not to take our rights for granted and to never allow ourselves to become complacent. Talking about abortion and what past generations of activists have worked so hard to achieve has never been so important. This project reflects how the experience of abortion can depend on so many social, political and cultural factors. We know that access to abortion is a collective struggle that transcends borders, nationalities and genders. That's why we decided to speak to people in our own communities in Italy, Spain and the UK who have either experienced abortion themselves or have been central to the fight for our reproductive rights. Northern Ireland has been at the forefront of the fight for reproductive rights in recent history, having decriminalised abortion in 2019. Abortion is no longer outlawed in Northern Ireland. According to the law, a person can request an abortion up to 12 weeks for any reason, and up to 24 weeks if there is a risk to the physical or mental health of the pregnant person. However, the government has consistently delayed the commissioning of full services, meaning that many people in Northern Ireland still have to travel to other parts of the UK to access abortions. In Belfast, we meet 26-year-old twins Natasha and Tina, who had abortions within a month of each other. Natasha knew within the first week, but you were the only one. Yeah. And then Natasha told her boyfriend, because no one can keep a secret in my family. It's so annoying. A sky behind the clouds. Natasha and Tina grew up in a country that remains deeply divided on many social and political issues. Growing up, me and Tina were always like a bit different. Not different, like weird or like it's not like we were bullied or anything, but we've always been quite progressive. Just things that are kind of normal if you go anywhere else, but here that's not the case. But just because the law has changed, it doesn't mean the cultural conversations around abortion have changed. And even when you have access to the right information, it can still be difficult to speak openly about abortion due to the widespread stigma attached to it. When I found out that I was pregnant, I didn't want to tell my family at all. Like, I never intended on telling them. But I came home and I don't know why, I just broke down crying. I just didn't know what I was going to do at all. There's not really much information that's that accessible in any sort of healthcare setting about it, especially for Northern Irish girls. Obviously we knew it was decriminalised, but we didn't know anything about it. Like, all, we heard the news and that was it. So I just had to research and research. The people in Northern Ireland um, do not want abortion. It's a well-known fact, even the, the, throughout the whole world. People know Ireland is a pro-life country. In addition to these limits, there are pro-life and anti-choice movements that do not respect a person's choice to do what they want with their body, but continue to intimidate those who want to terminate their pregnancy by demonstrating in front of abortion clinics. I went to the clinic, got harassed by protesters on the street. They are grabbing me in the middle of the street in a busy city centre and letting everyone know what I'm about to do. It's like you're a piece of meat for them to just scream at and it just feels like the entire politics of Northern Ireland are just right there. They just take your dignity from you, it's horrible. I do say like I'm pro-choice and I'm all about like women's autonomy over their body, but when I was in the position it was completely different. Like I just felt inherent guilt immediately. I felt so like kind of ashamed. And it wasn't just because, oh, I got pregnant. It was because I'm a girl who's from Northern Ireland and I got pregnant. We don't advertise that here. <laughs> like, if you go on an abortion, it's not a big... No one really knows. You don't really know anyone here who's had one, but we just don't talk about it at all. 
That's all you need is just to be heard and be able to talk without someone judging you. Because I think that's the only way you can get through it. We won't take it anymore. Whether abortion is legal or not, people still have abortions. The law just determines whether they have access to safe, legal and local abortions. Lum Quironero, a civil rights activist in Spain, describes the experience of having an abortion before it was legalised and the dangers and risks that come with that. Me quedé preñada por primera vez. Tendría 26, 27 años. Tenía el contacto en, en Holanda. En ese sentido, lo más difícil era como hacer ese gran esfuerzo de ir a un país extranjero o a ejercer un derecho que no podía ejercer en España. ¿no? Fue ya al principio de los 80. Era un momento en el que el aborto era ilegal, estaba penalizado. El aborto clandestino ha, había sido una alternativa en manos de, de médicos unidos pues, a las clases más adineradas ¿no? y que tenían medios y recursos y, y una cierta protección de su intimidad. Y para las clases populares, las mujeres con medio, menos medios, pues la única opción era o ir a alguien que te ayudara del barrio, alguna otra mujer que te ayudara, o ponerse en manos también de, de médicos que, que lo hicieran por precios, pues alto, altos precios, ¿no? Yo conozco a mujeres que abortaron en la mesa de la cocina, ¿no? Llegaba así y te colocaban donde podían y te hacían un raspado, ¿no? Y además a pelo. But how do we ensure that our rights are protected in law? Well, we take to the streets. Just like Italian activist and politician Emma Bonino did in the 1970s. Since 1978, people can get an abortion according to Law 194, which allows people to have an abortion exclusively in a public facility within the first 90 days of gestation or after 90 days if there are conditions of fetal abnormality or risk to the parent's life. However, this law has several limitations. È una legge con molti condizionamenti, alcuni anche ipocriti, perché l'articolo 1 già dice che puoi abortire se sei povera, se sei malata e non so quale altra cosa. Ovviamente era tutto abbastanza ipocrita perché non è che il consultorio verifichi il tuo 730 di tutta evidenza. As is the case across the world, abortion access has limitations. In Italy, providers can deny abortions based on moral or religious grounds, a practice known as conscientious objection. Gynecologist Frederica Brosio explains it to us. L'obiezione di coscienza indica la possibilità di rifiutare un dovere che, sebbene sia previsto dalla legge, va contro i credo etici, morali e religiosi di chi dovrebbe applicare quel dovere. Ci sono di varie sfaccettature dello, della non obiezione di coscienza, cioè tu puoi fare semplicemente le ecografie, puoi fare semplicemente gli ambulatori e i certificati, ma gli interventi, chi fa gli interventi, sono veramente pochi. Siamo veramente pochi, obiettivamente, questo. Quindi anche all'interno dei non obiettori c'è ancora diciamo, da, da scremare anche. Da un'inchiesta un che è stata fatta per i 44 anni dell'entrata in vigore della legge 194, una media del 70% sono obiettori. Mm? E ci sono delle regioni in cui c'è il 100% di medici obiettori. L'interpretazione di questi dati fanno venire fuori che l'Italia po cioè, possa essere equiparata ai paesi in cui l'aborto è vietato. In Italia è pieno di leggi così. Notate bene che sull'obiezione di coscienza io non ho niente contro, anzi, della coscienza individuale altrui. Già faccio difficoltà con la mia ogni tanto, quindi figura. Dico però che al di là delle scelte individuali e personali, la struttura deve applicare la legge. Gli piaccia o non gli piaccia, la legge è quella. 
invece è diventato adesso un modo di svuotare la legge abusando, se mi posso esprimere, dell'obiezione di coscienza della struttura in quanto tale. Cosa pensano i medici obiettori? Allora, io credo che non dovrebbero fare i ginecologi, perché il ginecologo ostetrico per, per antonomasia è colui che sostiene la donna, che supporta la donna, la salute della donna e anche questo fa parte della salute della donna. Purtroppo le università più forti in Italia sono tutte religiose e quindi essere obiettore ti dà più possibilità di carriera, questo è, è vero. In alcune strutture per entrare a lavorare tu devi eh, sottoscrivere cioè che sei un obiettore di coscienza, che sei sposato in chiesa, che non ti separerai mai, comunque quindi è comodo no? sottoscrivere queste cose, lavarsi le mani e andare avanti con la carriera dico. Diciamo la società è, è più avanti dei, dei decisori politici. No? Io ricordo quando è passata la legge sulle unioni civili e ci sono stati molti, ah, è cambiato il paese, è distrutta la famiglia, eccetera. E tu che dicevi, guardate che il paese è già cambiato, a voi non me ne siete accorti. Even when abortion access is written into law, the lines are constantly being redrawn. And even when abortion is legalized, access and enforcement of laws remains limited because of deep societal stigmas and women's expected role in society as mothers. We met Giselle, a 34-year-old woman who had two abortions. Yo soy Argentina, me crié en León. Yo además en Argentina tenía una familia muy matriarcal con muchas mujeres alrededor, nos criamos todas siempre como muy unidas y de ahí tengo un sentimiento tan fuerte por la maternidad. When she was 23, Giselle had to abort an extra uterine pregnancy. El primer niño me dejó una herida muy profunda respecto a que no podía estar cerca de un niño. Eh, no estaba apática, no era yo misma, no superaba esa pérdida. Porque para quien no lo vive, es algo como que lo perdió, pobrecita. Yo no quiero la pena de nadie. Yo quiero entender por qué no se lleva a cabo, o sea, por qué no llegó a, a su fin. No hay nadie que me pueda justificar esa tristeza que yo sentía. A few years later, Giselle had a second abortion not out of medical necessity, but because she chose to have one. El segundo fue doblemente traumático, porque no se piden que te tomes un periodo de reflexión. ¿Por qué? Si yo ya he decidido que no quiero tirar para adelante. Piensa de los tres días y vuelves. Esos tres días son una tortura para la persona que ya lo tiene decidido. Tú quieres abortar porque ya has tomado la decisión, ya no hay nada más que hacer. Cuando entras después de tres días, te piden que veas el feto. Me acuerdo hasta de la forma, si venía de un lado o venía del otro. Pregunto si yo aunque aborte hoy, el día de mañana voy a poder ser madre, porque yo tengo claro que quiero ser madre, pero sé que en ese momento ya no. Y se ríen de mí. ¿Cómo estás aquí abortando y quieres ser madre? Se ríen, te ridiculizan y encima la anestesia es insuficiente, te desangras por todas partes, te meten en una habitación, te dan un zumo de melocotón y te vas. Y te estoy hablando de hace 13 años, es que no han pasado 50. The pressure for women to fulfill their biological destiny is deep-rooted in society, and this stigma affects how abortion is perceived. In the second embarazo, I remember that my own family in Argentina and those women who I loved so much didn't see how I would abort. How would you abort? If we've all come forward. A child is always a synonym of happiness. Well, or not. If my goals are personal or personal, my child is another one. 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 Y yo me pregunto, ¿qué ganamos si yo tengo a este niño? ¿Cómo puedo yo enfrentarme a un hijo que no quiero? ¿Cómo le miro a los ojos? ¿Qué vida le voy a dar? Muchas veces somos consideradas simplemente vasijas que tenemos que procrear porque es la función que se nos ha marcado. No. Al final es una decisión personal que te va a llevar muy lejos y que tienes que tomar tú. No quita para que otra persona con 20 años diga, yo tiro para adelante porque yo quiero tener ese hijo. Perfecto, es tu decisión, pero lo has decidido. Ahí está el punto de inflexión. In the days since we spoke to Giselle, a new progressive abortion law was passed in Spain on February 28, 2023. The new bill ensures access to abortion in public facilities and removes the mandatory three-day reflection period for people wishing to terminate a pregnancy. 
Con esta ley, con la nueva ley del aborto, estamos garantizando que las mujeres puedan ejercer su derecho a la interrupción voluntaria del embarazo en el hospital más cercano a su domicilio y con la red pública como referencia. Y afirmamos además que el Estado reconoce y respeta la autonomía de las mujeres para decidir, que no dudamos de sus decisiones. The passing of this new law in Spain has shown that progress is possible and that a person's access to abortion should not depend only on the kindness of healthcare professionals, but it should be enshrined in law and protected by those in power. Tiggy is a 23-year-old woman from England who chose to have an abortion. Abortion has not been decriminalized in England, but it has been made legal since 1967. The current law allows abortions up to 24 weeks, and after that, only if the parent or child's health is at substantial risk. Across the board, for someone to have an abortion, two doctors still need to confirm that the legal requirements have been met. Tiggy described her experience getting an abortion. Hi, 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 my name is Tiggy. That it might be a good idea for me to share my own personal experiences of abortion. And what it's like to feel safe every step of the decision from conversations with her partner to undergoing the procedure. I found out I was pregnant about two months after I had come off of birth control because I was personally having a lot of issues. I've had struggles with mental illness in the past and I was concerned about being by myself and taking a lot of hormones. My period was late, I was feeling really sick and I thought something, you know, wasn't quite right. Both myself and my partner had spoken about what we would do if I was pregnant before I'd even taken the test. Um, and we both pretty much come to the consensus that we were not financially ready for a child. We were not emotionally ready <laughs> to have a baby. I took a pregnancy test. It was positive. After contacting her doctor, Tiggy was referred to an abortion clinic by the British Pregnancy Advice Service. So the day of the procedure, when I went in there, there were so many other people that were, you know, there also getting abortions. The staff were so friendly, I didn't feel like I needed to have somebody there. They called me into a room and we discussed my options, tried to make sure that I was definitely making the decision that was right for me. When it was time for the actual procedure, they wheeled me into a room and there were, I think, five members of staff, all of whom were women. I was talking to one of the nurses who was at my side holding my hand. They started to sedate me, so I went for the conscious sedation. And then after that, I only vaguely remember the motions of somebody being down there. I don't really remember anything else apart from that. I woke up, I felt a little bit queasy because of the medication. Um, they sat me up and they gave me a few minutes to kind of just collect myself and everything. And that was it. I took a week off of work and uni and that was all I needed really. At every single stage people were so supportive and you know telling me you're making the right decision you know everything's going to be fine. I feel really lucky and really privileged actually that I got to have such a positive experience because I know that it's not the same for everybody everywhere. Tiggy's story shows us how a person's experience of abortion can depend on so many factors but ultimately it is a right that should be protected. Having an abortion was probably the best decision that we could have made at that time. I just know that I could not have given that child my all. And I mean, my dream is to be a mum. That's all I've ever wanted. And so it was a really hard decision for me to make, but I ultimately knew that I wanted to be a mother under the right circumstances. Getting pregnant, giving birth, raising a child. It's not for everybody, and it's not for everybody right at that minute. Um, I think it really did save my life having an abortion, yeah. We recognise that there are systemic challenges when it comes to abortion rights, and we know that the future is uncertain. And with every new generation, there are new threats to our reproductive rights. It's been years that I'm going to get rid of it, 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 I'm going to get rid of it nelle tavole della legge, neanche nel marmo. I diritti sono qualcosa che va curata, difesa, eh, alimentata ogni giorno, se non rischia che un bel giorno ci si sveglia e non ce l'ha più. Punto. But there is power in speaking out, in having conversations and in sharing stories. And that is where we find the hope to keep fighting. Anticonceptivos para no abortar 
y aborto seguro y en la pública para no morir. Que viva la lucha de las mujeres. Muchas gracias.